Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. What are we talking about today, Tara? We are talking about the end of the Throne of Glass series. So part two, A Kingdom of Ash. And it's a large book, guys. A very large book. And a lot happens in the second part. A lot happens and it's a lot of battle, 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 and then waiting between, you know, strategizing about battle. So, and yeah, as we learned in the last part, a lot of these battles are happening outside of each other. So it's hard to keep track which battle what happened in. So if we mess it up, sorry, guys, <laughs> there's a lot of battles. It is the finale to this series. So I was so curious to see what Tara would think because I feel like the the series ends so differently from how it began. You know, like the scope was so small way back in Throne of Glass and the Assassin's Blade and you didn't really know where it was going. And then by the end of this book, you're just like, whoa, there's some really interesting things that happen and we'll talk more about them later. But so part two opens and we finally get back to our story with Dorian who has been practicing his shape-shifting power, and he has been flying to Morath. As you remember, he left Manon and the Thirteen behind and decided to go forward and see if he could steal the final word key from Erewhon himself. So he is in the form of a crow, trying to blend in with these other crows, just flying around, trying to dodge these, like if there's witches or wyverns on parole and stuff. He's just trying to get sneak past everything. And one of the cool things to me was when you're in his perspective, he's looking down at all of the destruction of Morath and thinking about Caltane, how she did this. And it was just this awe-inspiring moment. So that was like a little good nod back to her that I appreciated from him. Well, and he starts thinking about her as more than what he knew in the kingdom too, like more as a person instead of the flighty little like girl that was after him. Yeah. Little court games and such. We find out that he had taken the two word keys with him, but he buried them, which I was like, oh, no, that's dangerous. Something's going to happen in those freaking word keys while he's gone. Like, I was, my anxiety, like, kicked up, like, a lot during that. But we're okay, guys. If it was me that buried them, I would have forgotten where they were. Like, whoops, (laughs) no one's going to ever see those things again. Gone forever. And I'm not great at keeping a secret. So, like, I have zero poker face. Zero. So... When people asked me where they were, I'd be like, "Mm, I don't know. This goes back to Tara's resting bitch face. I don't know if I have a resting bitch face. Like, I I think I do. But also, like, I don't think it's, like, meant to be a resting bitch face. It's just, like, how my, I don't know. Like, I'm not bitchy most times, I guess. Maybe we should take a poll, like attach one to the Spotify episode. Like, let us know if you think Tara has a resting bitch face. (laughs) I'm a nice person, really, guys. She is. She's a sweetie. My my little Taurus. Although Taurus and Cancers can be a little feisty, too. Just depends on how you get us. So. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll say two of my besties are Tauruses. It's like you and Tessa. Tara and Tessa are Tauruses. And then you got an Aries thrown in there, too, with Uh, David. uh, uh, uh uh We all have very similar, like, personalities, though. (laughs) With, like, we're nice people until you test us, and then... You're dead to me. We're not nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Which is weird that we get along so well, because typically if you're alike, you don't get along very well, I would think. Although, I don't know. I was, we had our moments like growing yeah. up. It's just like the adolescent stuff that you grow out of. Like it just took time and growing up, but like, yes. Anyway, now that everyone's gotten the <laughs> download on our astrological signs, <laughs> We're helpful. this is the content that you came for. Um, anyways, back to Mora. So Dorian flew in as a crow, saw Caltane's damage, and then he turns into a rat. 
And he's like just creeping around the corridors, watching his back. And he finds Erewhon's council chamber. And who does he find, Dara? Maeve is there. So he finds Maeve. And I found it really like funny that Maeve caught on to who he was very, very quickly and called him out. Um, but yes, Maeve is there. And while he's in the room with Erewhon, Maeve lets him like just chill and listen to everything. And nobles are refusing to kneel and like there's no longer like a neutral with Maeve like everybody has turned against her which is why she is in Mora she is trying to build herself back up and like keep herself safe because she no longer has the fae she does still have the healers that she has been keeping like enslaved to her though and the Karen Kui like they're still on Mm -hmm. her side But otherwise, she has no more backing. Yeah, this was a little bit of the conversation that we had been having in the prior episode, talking about all of the loss that she had gone through. And so we were like, okay, she's basically on her own team now. So she's going to have to make a strategic alliance if she wants to, you know, overcome and win. But what does that really entail? Because she spent all this time running away from Erewhon. Is this a true alliance type of thing? So she is having conversations with Erwan, trying to align herself there, but we know that she probably has her own plans. And she also has plans for Dorian probably too, is like what you get the sense of. She's just trying to manipulate him. Mm -hmm. But while Dorian is in Morath, he comes upon a room that makes him feel sick and it makes him feel very unsettled and we come to find that that is Erwan's actual tomb, where he's kept, where the collars are kept. And that's where Maeve basically calls Dorian out and is like, oh, I know it's you. I'm defenseless against Erwan. One fey remains blood oathed. And so when I'm reading that part, I'm just thinking about the owl that has been hanging around, like that we haven't really gotten a lot of information about. Well, but we also know that there's one missing member of the cadre, Vaughn. And so I'm also thinking it could be him Mm. because Mm. he was part of the cadre that was blood oath to her and he's Faye. So I don't know if the healer that she has is actually Faye, if it's like a normal human. Yeah. Like Irene. And she's just enslaved her somehow. Like maybe she has like a collar or a ring or something. So it's very unclear what her next steps are and what her and Erwan could possibly do together. But there is some bizarre shit going on in Morath. At one point, Maeve is trying to seduce Erwan, which is not the brother that she married or was interested in. She was interested in the biggest, baddest one, which was Orcus. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the one she married, and she married him for his library, so I don't think she was actually interested in him. But the reason she's trying to seduce Erewhon, though, is connected to something else that happens, which is that Dorian and Maeve kind of form an alliance, and Dorian proposes marriage to Maeve and basically says you can be the queen of, like, the largest territory if you you help me get rid of Erewhon. I mean, it's kind of that lesser of two evils kind of a thing, but also, like, poor Dorian, if he gets stuck with her, like, poor Dorian, because you know he's in love with Manon, A. But B, Maeve is, like, a bitch. Yeah. So I don't want Dorian to be with Maeve. But anyway, so basically she goes to seduce Erewhon to, like, allow... Dorian to sneak around some more and find that area where he has the word key. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I I was like, oh, we're going to get a redemption arc for Maeve? Yeah, I don't know if there's any redeeming her. (laughs) That's what it it kind of seemed like for a little bit, for a minute there. Like that we were supposed to be on Maeve's side. Yeah, I had no idea where it was going the first time. And Dorian, I felt kind of bad for Dorian because... I mean, he pro- he did the marriage proposal thing with Manon too, and then here he is doing it again with Maeve. I'm like, okay, Dorian, is this your only, is this your only tactic? Manon proposed marriage to Dorian. Dorian didn't propose marriage. Manon did, and 
said something about like she would be willing to make that sacrifice. And he's like, well, I don't really want you to marry me if it's going to be a sacrifice. Like, oh. Yeah, that's right. So he basically turned down Manon by leaving. Mm -hmm. By going, peace. But Maeve was not playing fair this whole scene. She, like, morphed into Aelin at one point with Erewhon, and then she, like, changed into Manon. I was like, what the hell? And he just, like, didn't even bite was like okay bye thanks <laughs> shut the shut the door in her face like rejected you are my brother's wife and poor little dorian's watching this happen right and when when she switched to manon like everyone's like ooh yeah like i like that kind of got a little excited and dorian's like in his head like stay away from manon stay away from manon like, he's getting all jealous. And then Erwan's like, no, I know who you are. You're my brother's wife. Go away. Mm-hmm. I just like how that finally explained why Manon was getting away with so much, you know, whenever she was back under her mom and all of the other Iron Teeth clans and when Harrington was just not really caring about some of the shortcomings that Manon and some of the decisions that she was making. Like, oh, okay, this makes sense now. So he had like a thing for this descendant of their kings or whatever. Yeah, which is really creepy because you don't know whose descendant she is. <laughs> like, is he attracted to his like granddaughter or something? Ew, yeah. I mean, it's Erewhon. He probably is. Let's just, it's probably not above some incest. So that's Morath in a nutshell. It's just a lot of political maneuvering, but you know Erewhon is still trying to get his own thing going, and same with Maeve. They're all doing it for their own selfish reasons. And then there's just Dorian trying to be a rat and, and play for the good side. And then we go to Orinth, and it's just the aftermath of the battle that was horribly lost. So you have... Elias of the Silent Assassins comforting Ansel, Ansel, who lost so many of her men in that battle. And then Darrow showing some personal growth as well in the council room. There were some like really sweet scenes between like that and Lysandra and Evangeline. And one of the funniest lines that I thought um, in this part of the book by Adian, because Evangeline is talking about how she threw up and he's like well better than shitting your pants sweetheart there was like that line and he's just trying to comfort her and in, in only a way that a military commander adian could do and it just made me chuckle his way with little girls that sounds bad sandra <laughs> no not like that but you know yes he was being as like a sweet older brother kind of a thing like mm -hmm. better than shitting your pants <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um, but before, like, we, back in Morath, we saw the whole Morath army leave, like, disappear. So they're somewhere now. They're not in Morath anymore. And Maeve had tried to trick Erewhon, saying that she can show him his brothers, but she can't bring them over and blah, blah, blah. Tried to make herself, like, somebody he wants to partner with. And so that also, like, whose side is she on? Because she's proposing or, like... In this alliance with Dorian, but also trying to talk Erewhon into being in an alliance with her. So she's playing the field, I think, a little bit. Yeah, she's certainly hedging her bets. And then wanting to slim down the competition and then just deal with whoever remains type of thing. And Adian and Lysandra are setting up a trap for the Morath army, which is not going to go well, I don't think. But they're trying... <laughs> They're trying. And Maeve gets with Dorian, I think, and explains that she is going to set kind of a trap for Erewhon and fake showing him his brothers. And so Dorian can get into the tower to get the word key. So we're back on Maeve's on Dorian's side for the moment, at least, trying to help him get the, the key. And then we see him get the key, which is super sad because the key is in another girl much like Caltain, and they are like basically making her the lock and they're going to put all the keys in her if they can find them, which is what they had wanted to do to Caltain, but she had a little bit too much spirit for, for that. And this girl doesn't. It's driven her crazy 
and she wants to die, which is hard for Dorian because he doesn't want to kill her, but he also understands her point of wanting to die and not wanting to live like that anymore. And then do you want to talk about the the scene with Dorian and Maeve next, Sandra? Because it's it's awesome. Do you I don't remember what scene, what scene it is? No. Okay. So then Dorian shows us his true like poker face because he was tricking Maeve that whole time. And basically he traps her and he pieces out. Like he he had been studying Maeve and her like magic and he had been diving into her magic to where he could like learn it because as we know Dorian's magic can pretty much do whatever he wants it to do. And so he had been diving into Maeve's magic to where he could learn how she uses it. And he uses it against her, which is fun. I like how this is in line with who Dorian has always been since the first books, like being very studious and like spending lots of time in the library, gaining wisdom and learning about things. I like how it was very consistent with his character there. And also another consistency with his character is He has been working very, very hard to place his magic in key parts of Morath so that he can take it down, all of it, all the remaining bits. And so he's been placing little pieces of ice in like key parts, and then he pulls them out and the whole thing crashes around Maeve and Erewhon. It's like finishing what Caltaine started. Yeah, too bad the army wasn't there. And his parting words to Maeve were even better, which is that only one witch was going to be his queen. Mm. (laughs) Tara likes it. (laughs) Oh, Dorian. Meanwhile, with like Kale, I mean, Nezrin and Sartak, they have been paroling on the rooks. And so they find out the Farian gap has been empty. So again, this goes back to... Morath's troops are on the move. Where the hell are they? Because they are not where they're supposed to be. But we pretty much knew the whole time that this was going to be an uphill battle for Aelin and crew, even with all of the allies that she's collected over the years through good favors and life debts and that sort of thing, because there's just, there's still so much that they're up against. But there are like some really good moments that needed to happen too, before all of this shit just starts happening. Like, Kaol comes to terms with, you know, becoming a father with Irene. And there was, okay, who was he talking to when he's talking to Adian? Like, will Adian will forgive you? Like, what was that conversation about? I forget. Oh, he's talking to Gabriel. Duh. Yeah. He's currently with Aelin and Gabriel and that crew. Yeah. Gabriel is like the sweetest because he's congratulating them on the baby and feeling all in his feelings about being a dad and never knowing it and missing out on all this time with Adian. And then Kaol is just like, well, Adian will forgive you. (laughs) And we haven't seen any sign of that because Adian has been so resentful and bitter in his interactions with Gabriel to this point. But like, I just really appreciated that moment. Parent-child relationships are really hard. And I just, Gabriel ended up being a surprise like favorite side character. Yes, especially when you don't have years to have built that relationship. It's hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see another relationship that's not great, even though they did have years to build it. But Kale and like his crew, whatever, um, found Vernon. And they got a lead to come up and basically said, you get to choose what happens to him after we get the information we need. And Alid, like, wants him dead fast because she thinks she owes that to her dad to let her his brother die fast. And, and Lorcan's like, fuck that shit. Dude needs to suffer. Um, but Alid's like, no, like, he needs to die fast. And then I think he said something or did something. And so they just leave him in there to starve to death, which was not a fast death. It was kind of cruel, right? It was yes. a bit, uh, uh. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. I feel like I would be more like an elite in this situation where I would want revenge and stuff, but then I would just be like, oh, you know, that's too that's too much. That's like crossing a line type of thing. I feel like I would be that way if it was me that they hurt. 
But if mm. it were my kids, I feel like I'd be like, I am skinning you alive, bitch. So I think it depends on who was the victim in the crime for me. Does the little romantic scene between Elite and Lorcan happen after this Vernon stuff? Yes. This is like one of the things that irks me about this book is like we got to hang with Aelin and Rowan when they were getting close and intimate and getting to know each other. And then Lorcan and Elid were teased. They're basically like talking about how far each of them has gone. And Elid's like, oh, I'm not a virgin. Like I've, I've, you know, slept with someone once before and basically it wasn't anything special. And so Lorcan is just like trying to figure out how to be with her physically. And she says, show me everything. And then you know that they get together and he suspects that that they're mated, but like it's a fade to black type of thing. Like we don't get to see anything. And I'm like, I want to know what everything consisted of. (laughs) 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 Oh, yeah. yeah there, but that's just some, me. There's some sweet moments, promptly followed by very unsweet moments most of the time, which is, yeah. is like we can't live in our happy moments in this book because they're promptly followed by like destruction. Sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Sacrifice. And like, yeah. Which one of those sweet moments is the witches arrive in Orinth to help save everybody in the battle. Which is very, very sweet because the wishes have been kind of like on both sides for a while, like, and out of everything. So to see them all show up and Manon show back up because she owed it to both Aelin and Dorian to help them. It was very sweet. And then we see another sweet moment because Lysandra and Adian are arguing, right? And... They argue um, a lot. They do. They're funny, too, though. But, like, Sandra, Adian's like, no, you need to go. Like, you're not going into battle today. Like, go away. Like, I don't want you in the front lines. And, like, Sandra's like, um, you let everybody else battle. And he's like, but I'm not in love with everybody else. And I'm like, Adian. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> He still got some some room. I mean, okay. to grow a little bit because the things he said to her in the previous book, like I'm still angry. They were still mean, angry. unnecessary things. Yes. Yes. But also, I really relate to Adian's desire and need to protect Lysandra because as we have seen, Lysandra goes to bat in these battles and skirmishes. She doesn't play some bit role on the sidelines or like some support role. She is in the thick of it, getting brutalized and hurt every time. So, I mean, I can understand where Adian is coming from because with Lysandra, she's out there actually doing stuff, putting herself in a very dangerous spot to lose her life. I can see where he's coming from, but I can also see where she's coming from. Like, And wanting to be out there and wanting to, like, have control over her own life because she hasn't had that in the past. But Mm -hmm. also, I can see where she's coming from, that she is more angry about what he did to her than what other people have done to her. Because she can handle the physical pain. She's had to. It's the emotional. Like, when she connects with somebody, because she hasn't had that connection, like... For them to let her down is so much worse than being punched or being bit or being whatever out on the battle. It's expectations being broken, right? Mm -hmm. It's like trust being shattered. She doesn't let herself be seen by just anyone. And for her to open up and trust him enough to get to know her and then for him to shit all over her, that's... And her past. Yeah, that's where it... I draw the line for me too. Like, I feel like you and I would have very similar reactions to Lysandra. Like it's, it's not even shitting all over her. It's the shitting all over her and her past that he knows she had no control over. Mm-hmm. It's not like she chose to do half that shit, but he still like treated her like a whore. Yeah. And so that to me, I'm like, you knew better. Yes. But at least that's why it felt better when he said he wasn't in love with everyone else. He was in love with her. 
So, mm-hmm. I mean, that was that was some cookie points there for him. And also, Lysander totally deserved this. But when Daro formally recognized, what is it, Caravir, what is it called? Mm-hmm. As a actual, you know, place or a state or whatever you want to call it. The yeah, that happens is... a little bit later because he also recognizes Evangeline as his. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, the little old man's getting it. He's getting it. I know, growth. We hated him and now he's like turned a corner. But... The sad scene that happens right after Lysand- Lysandra, not Lysandra, Lysandra and Adian have this little chat is Adian gets stabbed by a Vogue prince. And so Lysandra's out on the battlefield doing her thing and Adian gets hurt really bad and she just doesn't see him for a little while. And she's like, what's going on? So that's the sad part. Mm-hmm. And then the the Lorcan and the lead spicy scene happens that Sandra both liked and did not like because there wasn't enough. You can't share dialogue of a lead saying, show me everything. And then it just cut scene. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> well, you get to pick what everything was. Sure. Sure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a drive your own story. What would you have liked him to do? I do like Lorcan, though. I mean, he is far from perfect, but I think that's what makes him so interesting. It's, I don't know. It's like the total. I feel like every guy I've liked has had like this roller coaster thing going on because I liked Lorcan and then he was mean to lead. And then I liked him again because he was like nice. And now he's like up here. And Adian liked him mean to Lysandra up again. Kale was more like, woo. <laughs> And then a little bit up. It was a weird roller coaster with Kale. Even Rowan. Gavriel has always been up. Like, there's, he has not done anything that I didn't like. So if I'm picking a character, it's Gavriel. It's his wisdom and age. He's my man. Through. Mm-hmm. He's mine. I claim him. R.I.P. <laughs> Don't say that yet. That has <laughs> not happened. Everybody understands. No, I... Even on a second read through, I was listening to the audiobook. I wasn't actually reading, you know, the physical book, but it was, I was still getting teary eyed and weepy, especially. Mm-hmm. There were a few scenes, a few deaths in this part of the book that I'm just like, oh, I can't handle it. Can we talk about like the first major group? We're of almost deaths? to that point. Okay. We're okay. Almost to that point. Okay. Um, so. We see Dorian come back in. So Dorian's there and Aelin's there. Well, not in Orinth, but they are like meeting up on their way to Orinth, right? And then um, we also see that Iskra's bull attacks Abraxos. So stupid bitch needs to die. And Petra saved him. And Petra saved him because that's the same thing that happened to Keeley. Is Iskra's bull attacked Keeley. And Petra and killed Keely. And so um, Petra's like, no, like, I'm drawing the line. You're being a bitch. And so Petra and the Blue Bloods change sides and they start fighting with Manon and the Krakens and the 13. And then Petra kills Iskra. So finally, Shake's dead. Long overdue. And it was the most intense scene, too, because. There was a hot second there. I was like, oh my God, she's going to sacrifice herself to put an end to this bitch once and for all. Because, I mean, it was a straight nose dive vertically, just high speed. I was like, no, no, it's happening all over again. And so that was a very quick rundown of what happens between the witches. But now we're to the scene that Sandra really wants to talk about. So Sandra, take it away. I just have such feelings. This is the part that hurt me the most out of everything when I first read it. And it was the 13 sacrificing themselves to save the rest for the greater good. And the scene was very cinematically done. You had flashes, little snippets of each one. So the crazy eyed, like chaotic twins, just blood lust and like doing their thing. And then you had... Astrin just like taking off her shirt and you can see the scar of you know the word unclean on her and she's just like going at it killing him and so basically the 13 are trying to slash their way through 
before this witch can do the yielding and power up the witch tower that's going to annihilate everything in its path. So it's a race to do that. And so it's a very high stakes scene. And the part that hurt was all through the series, the witches just walk around with this pride and this chip on their shoulder. Like they're so intrinsically just evil and that's what they are at their core. And when they die, they return to darkness. And then when this happened, it wasn't that at all. It was the complete opposite. Like they went out in this brilliant burst of light to save everyone. And Manon is far off across the battlefield and beside herself because that's her family. That's who she's been with for over a century. And she couldn't do anything about it. And it it just, it hurt. I was like, no. There's no more 13. I'm so basically 12 of the 13 like went through the yielding to bring down this witch tower and kill Manon's grandma in the process. And so they basically, I don't know, committed suicide like mm-hmm. to take down this witch tower to save everybody else. And so it was a very poignant scene. And then there were some very poignant scenes afterwards with like the people coming out and laying flowers at the site and like just supporting and commemorating the sacrifice that those witches made, which is one of the things that wouldn't have happened in the past because everybody was so divided and witches weren't supposed to be here and blah, blah, blah. And so to have, you know, the Fae and the humans and the witches all together mourning the loss of witches it brought out you know the camaraderie that was needed and then it also fulfilled a part of the kind of omen or whatever you want to call it that was passed down prophecy that was passed down through the witch lines about them never going back to the wastelands and it never producing you know crops or whatever to let them survive until certain things happened and one of those was that flowers grew out of a battlefield or whatever and them laying down the flowers the humans laying down the flowers of orinth on that battlefield was you know that sign of it and then i know me and sandra talked about this because yes the witches all said that they go into the darkness but the 13 went to light i attributed that to usually the witches died doing the wrong thing doing something bad And so they went into the darkness, but the 13 died doing something for the good of others. And so they went into the light. It was just so so another, like, just, Mm -hmm. just so poignant. So many like things coming to. Manon is quite like, not quite the same after the 13 sacrifice either. She's very much a shell. There's like a, a very heavy somberness about her after that. Very understandable. But the prophecy was like, so like chilling to me because you always expect, oh, the curse is going to be broken and literal flowers are going to grow out of the ground. You don't think of it in terms of the dark, whereas, oh, they died there and it's a memorial. Like, oh, but that makes such sense now. Well, and when the curse was like, this is a spoiler, but when the curse is lifted, which it does get lifted at the end and they're explaining the pieces of the curse, And, you know, you're seeing that in your head, like, oh, this happened and this happened. And when it happened, it was just one of those scenes where I'm like, everything came together. And again, it's one of those times where, like Sandra keeps saying, like she, Sarah J. Mass is so good at like spider webs and then bringing it all together and showing you everything that you read and how it interconnects. Because I didn't. I mean, it was a very sad scene, but I didn't put that together with the curse and that being the flowers that needed to happen until that curse was lifted. And then you went through it and you're like, it was the same thing with like the King of Otterland's eyes, right? Because they said from the very beginning, he looked nothing like them. His eyes were dark. It's like, she's so good. It's like tiny little details like that, that just seem random and then bringing it all together. And then they're not. Which we'll get more. Yeah. 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 The next scene, we find out even more because Dorian and Aelin show up together and they're talking about the lock and who's going to forge it and who's going to pay that sacrifice and all of that. And there was a vote and when it was going to happen. And there was a vote 
And it's basically Aelin's going to do it and she's going to do it right now. Like she doesn't have time to like try and not worm her way out, but like figure out a different way. And then I don't remember how this idea came out, but it was decided that if they do it together, maybe they both survive. Like maybe each of them can give half. And so then they're going to do it together. So they're in the process of forging this lock, Dorian and Aelin, and Dorian's dad shows up as the spirit. And he's like, let me do it. It's our bloodline. So let me take your part in it. And he basically sacrifices himself, his afterlife, all like of his creation to get Dorian out of it. And this ties back into that mass prophecy storytelling as well, because all along Aelin was hearing the queen that was promised and you know, nameless is, nameless is the price. Mm-hmm. And then we, it occurs to everyone that, you know what? Dorian's father's name was never mentioned, not once in this entire series. Like, what is up with that? Is it an oversight in the writing? No, it's part of the major plot. Um, Dorian's father is nameless. And this, I don't know, was this my second favorite part? It might have been. It was just that kind of emotional closure that Dorian needed to move on to because mm-hmm. he wasn't the same after having to kill his dad in an earlier book either. And we find out that Erwin had wiped his name from history, like all of it. It's not that we just don't know, like there's some sort of curse or whatever. It's that nobody will remember his dad as a person. I mean, they might remember him as the king that like did all these things, but they will not remember him. It was akin to Maeve making everyone in the world believe there was a third sister, right? Mm -hmm. And her ruling. And Erewhon did the same thing with Dorian's father, which we do find out, though, what his name was. And that, you you want to share about it. It was such a good scene. So his name, there's only one time that even he remembered his name. And it was when he had his eldest son. And so Dorian was named after his own dad because that was the only time he remembered his actual name and that the demon or bog or whatever inside of him, he was able to overpower for just that second, the human inside of him was, and named Dorian. Yeah, it was such a sweet moment. I was like, oh, and it's very it's like very abruptly after this so dorian's just like okay so my dad is willing to pay the price here he cared all along like i share the same name with my father and then dorian's a little bit slower on the uptick to figure out what's going on because alien a alien (laughs) alien always scheming as soon as she takes dorian's father's hand she's just like shoving him out of this weird like in-between realm back through the doorway and then it's this really cool scene like you can almost visualize the magic bleeding out of them just draining out of them and doesn't Dorian's father eventually like he just disappears and like moves on it's very much like and if you have not seen this movie I apologize for this but (laughs) like spoiler yeah you should have at this point like or seen some spoilers one or the other but it was very much in my head like i think it, the marvel movie where they all turn to ash oh yeah mm-hmm. where they're all like and spider-man's like help me i don't feel right i don't feel so good you're all right i don't i don't know what's happening i don't know what's happening. I don't want to go. That's the I don't want to go. vision I had in my head of Dorian's dad. Yes. And then we're left with Aelin, who we know was just, had so much power. I mean, there's a goddess in her bloodline. And so her power is still going on being There's drained, multiple drained, goddesses drained. in her bloodline. Yeah. There's an interesting uh, scene with all of these gods because they're in this kind of weird locked place together trying to figure out how they're going to get back to where they belong and all this shit and mala doesn't mala kind of betray Mm -hmm. the rest of them because yeah because mala actually remembers Mm -hmm. she remembers her human life which she's not supposed to but she does and she is quite feisty about what they're doing to her bloodline and so she gives her the power of a star, I think is what it's 
a drop of it or something. Right? Yeah. And Aelin uses this power. Well, first, Aelin tries to make a new deal with the gods. And this new deal is that they leave Elena alone. They let her live out her eternity here with her, like, oh, love. Yeah. And she will keep Erewhon. Like, they don't have to take and destroy Erewhon. If they leave Elena, they can leave Erewhon too. And so they're safe. And the gods betray her. Wasn't it primarily Deanna? Mm hmm. She was yeah. a little shit. Mm hmm. And Deanna destroyed Elena anyway. And so Mala gave her the power to seal the gate in the form of the drop of a star or whatever, because that was her daughter that was just destroyed by Deanna. And she remembered who that was to her. And she remembers what they're doing to her line. And so she basically called them out on it and gave Aelin the ability to close them in. And Aelin closes them into a hell realm. <laughs> She's like, you bitches, you're going to suffer. Like, you're not just going to go, like, to enjoy your life in another earth realm or whatever. No, here you go, you bitches. That, mm, that was an incredible scene. Because Maul is locked a lot in of there. Incredible scenes. I know. I'm like the whole book. I'm just like something big is happening. You're like constantly. this is my my favorite part. This is my favorite part. This is this is it. Like you don't even remember until you like talking about yeah. it. But I'm like Maul, a firebringer. She was locked in there herself too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just it was so fucked up because who was Elena's husband's name? Was that uh, Gavin? Yes. He wants her to spend eternity with him so bad. And you have Aelin going out on a limb, trying to make one last deal, you know, yeah. always doing what she can to make others happy, even if they're not alive, you know, in this existence. And, and even then, if they've, like, irritated the fuck out of her for the last yeah. two years. Like, if they meant well and they were trying to work toward the greater good, Aelin sees that. It, it means something to her. But then for Deanna mm -hmm. to just be like, nope vamoos dead gone like yeah. wiped from existence it was so fucked up and then it's like one of the coolest scenes in sarah j mass worlds to me is aelin falling through worlds it's just she's like yeah. just constantly falling well let's 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 get to why she's falling Be because she used all of the magic to get them out and to lock them into their little hell world that <laughs> mala gave her she has no magic of her own. So she's like, shit, I'm stuck here. Like, I'm not dead, which is what, like, I was supposed to be at this point. I don't have anybody else here with me to help me, and I'm stuck here. But Rowan has been picking up on some of Elena's, like, strategy. And in his tattooing of her tattoos back on her back, he put some word marks in there. And he also put some on himself. And so these word marks are trying to pull her home. And so she starts falling through worlds and she falls, she like gets like some speed going and there's a world where she like connects with one of the fae in that world and he sends out his power and slows her down and then she lands in her world. Yes. I thought that scene was so great. Such a cool scene. I'm I'm glad that you enjoyed that one as well. And I remember it being so emotional because Rowan has no idea what the hell is going on. He just saw them vanish and all he can do is feel the bond weakening by the second as she just soars through these worlds. I mean, she's seeing all kinds of worlds, pine and snow, like a city on a curved river. And then this one with Faye. I mean, she's just like plummeting through and he's just like, oh my God, I'm losing my maid and my car and I'm like, and... Mala coming she in with that back. little drop mm -hmm. makes it back. Such a cool scene. I'm glad you like that one too a lot. And then the next scene I liked a lot too. Because it was a <laughs> We're like, we just like all of them. <laughs> Alid and Aelin, where Alid gives Aelin the ring that stops her from being able to be like attacked by Volg. And Aelin at first like, no, that was meant for you. And I forgot what Elite says to her that makes her take it. Doesn't but she basically say, my mom sacrificed her life and, you for know. For you. Every, yeah, for to save you. Like you're going for to. For you to rule, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we need you to rule. And then back in freaking Orinth for a death that like kills you, Murtaugh dies. The little old man. Just out trying to do his best in the world. Was watching Evangeline. Yeah. 
And And right before he goes out to the battle, Evangeline's like, if I had a grandpa, I'd want him to be you. And I'm like, oh, my God. (laughs) I can't handle the little girl finding, like, her family and then, like, in the worst way possible, losing them. Moving right along from that that scene, we see the little people show up for Aelin. And this is right at the same time that Daro is recognizing Lysandra as the lady of whatever the C word, Caravar Car- or whatever. Caravar, yeah. And then she's he's also recognizing Evangeline as his heir and Aelin as the true queen, right? Like yes. all of these people are getting like recognized. Aelin's not there yet, but like he is saying, you know what, I understand. You guys are the one willing to sacrifice for this country. You are, like, this is your home. And then Aelin arrives. And the little people had helped her out. And they had brought the Lord of the North. And so she arrives in Orinth, riding the Lord of the North with his antlers all ablaze. And then everybody's trying to, like, peace out, get into the the castle because, you know, all of Morath's army is now in Orin, and they're raining bloody murder all over everybody. And so Gavriel's running with Adian, and Adian and Gavriel end up in like trying to close the doors, right? And they're losing. And Gavriel goes outside and starts attacking the people outside and gets locked out and ends up dying. So that's that's the death scene that affected me the most because like he was always always trying to make the world a better place and the one thing he wanted to do which was to reconnect with his son he didn't get to do yeah that part made me cry too i was just like okay hordes of enemy army rushing to the um the gate and it can't get shut and gabriel of course goes out there to shut it himself and then they just find his body out there broken later, his golden hair. It was like all of the feelings bubbling up for Adian because just the weight of everything that he had said to Gabriel and how he treated him and all of the things that he had left unsaid, just kind of. He has a lot of those moments where he mm. he's feeling bad for things he said. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a little, you know, impulsive. He gets a little emotional, but I think it's only because he cares so much and he, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just. He's deep down a good guy. He just doesn't know how to like be that good guy with also the bad guy he has to be. Yeah. I did think that the final showdown between Aelin and Dorian and Lysandra and Elite is there was really cool how it was done because it was very much a team effort. And again, we got to have Irene kind of front and center front and center show why she was so important in Tower of Dawn, Mm -hmm. why they were after the healers and especially Irene Towers, because in their world where these Volg come from, the healers, the, the ones with that power are called the executioners. They're the ones that deal out death, which is so cool for Irene. And but there was also a phrase that uh, that Aelin was screaming in like chapter 112. She was like, up against so much and she started yelling I am not afraid and I will kill you and I'm like what does that remind us of Sam Sam it like came you know full circle like she just carried that with her in her heart well, the whole time when she's doing that so Aelin after Gabrielle dies Aelin's out there by herself and nobody else knows that she's lost pretty much all of her magic Like she has a tiny little ember left, but pretty much all of it's gone. And so she goes and she like kind of stops Erwan and Maeve because they don't know she's out of magic. And Erwan's like, "Eh, do I really want to go against her? And um, she is holding Goldrum and a shield. And she has in like before she lost her power, she in in dude. What word am I looking for? Oh, imbued. Imbued, yes. I was like, embedded? No. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, imbued them with her magic. So they are the flames that are around her right now. 
And she is kind of like attacking Maeve and Erewhon to try and force them back a little bit before they realize that she does like that's all she has. And so that is what she is doing. She's basically laying down her life to do this. And the cadre are with her, the rest of them. They are out there and Maeve is going into their minds and like showing them their deepest, darkest fears. And Aelin is getting pissed off because she's seeing Rowan and Fenris cowering and afraid. And Fenris is seeing his brother die. And Rowan is seeing him losing Aelin and things like that. And he's also seeing his ex-wife. Or, well, I guess she's not really his ex-wife, but like Lyra. And she's being mean to him, but you're the reason. You're the, like, you're at fault. You're horrible male and all these things. And it's just not a good time for anybody. And then Erewhon disappears. Like, uh, like an Ilkin or something comes and grabs him and takes him. And we see that that is actually Lysandra. And she grabbed him because she, and this was Elid's idea, but Elid's like, wait, I think Irene can help. She can, she can help us. So Irene, Dorian, Lysandra, and Elid are all up on the top of like a roof. And they brought Erewhon there. And Dorian is using his magic. And Lysandra turns into like the little like white cat thing that she does. I forgot what it's called. Snow leopard. Snow leopard. And they're holding him down. One of them stabs him while Irene is using her powers to try and pull the bog out of him. That's right. They stabbed him with Damaris, the truth teller mm-hmm. sword. And that's how Irene pulls out Dorian's father's name. Because the comet Erwan refuses to tell him. And so because he, yeah. they, he was impaled by Damaris, Irene gets that information. And Erwan is like, he remembered it once when he first beheld you. Yeah. And then that's when like the chills just came yes. out. You're like, oh. And we see that Irene is super talented. And the reason that they're wanting her is she is like the descendant. She is the one that can do this. And he was wanting to use her as a weapon instead of a healer. Yeah, she's a descendant of Silva, right? Was Uh Silva in that group of gods that were locked Uh in the hell realm? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, they didn't specifically say that, but afterwards, everybody was saying Silva's gone all of these gods are gone and like naming specific gods, but we didn't actually see her in that. We just hear that every god is gone, mm-hmm. even Silva. It's, yeah, it's such an interesting, like to be a little fly in the hell realm, seeing all of these squabbling gods that don't belong together and just want to mm-hmm. go home. It's such an interesting storyline to me. And so Irene is successful in destroying Erewhon, which is great. Another Marvel scene. He basically falls apart. Turned into this like little worm kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was all the humanity left in the sky. And then we go back to Aelin and she is now on her own with Maeve, right? Back when Dorian and Maeve were together, Dorian, part of his like messing with her magic, basically took away her ability to portal. Like he changed, like he's powerful enough that he changed her magic. Like that scene, I was like, wait, he, he... fucking just took away part of her powers like that was crazy to me but anyway so Aelin's losing ground Maeve has I think figured out that she doesn't have her powers and that she's using the weapons and whatever um and so she's got kind of a little bit of a a leg up but Aelin being Aelin gets her to come close to her and puts the ring on her so now she can't do anything it's like straight poison for yeah. her, like just directly injected into the bloodstream. It's like can't, basically can't. like them putting a ring on a human and they can now like control a little bit. That's kind of like what that feels like to her. She doesn't have any of her powers as a Volg. She doesn't, she's not able to do anything. Yeah. It's Silva's ring. I mean, Maeve was dishing it out. Like Fenris had his face basically smashed in and was looking real rough. 
But Maeve finally gets what's coming to her because it was very satisfying when Fenris, you know, teleported behind her and then just like freaking stabbed her through with Goldrin. And then Mm -hmm. who was it that beheaded her? I can't remember who it was exactly. But then like they take the extra measure, take her head and then fucking like burn her, like make sure she's completely gone, (laughs) gone. Like yes. she was, she was like triple killed. No, quadruple killed. <laughs> yes, everyone got their Just turn to make sure. at killing Maeve. <laughs> so they won. They beat Erwin and Maeve at the same time. Woohoo! To the the good guys. Yay! And then Falcon and then gets there's... to meet his niece, Lysandra. Lysandra gets yes. to figure out that she mm. had family, like real family that cared about her. And he left everything to her. And she's like, I've got everything I need kind of a thing. It was so sweet. I was just going to talk about like some of the, like the Gavriel scene where mm-hmm. they prepare his body. It's being honored and all of this stuff. Adian takes Aelin to Gavriel's tomb, body, whatever you want to call it. And she still does like the blood oath type of thing that she can like even in death for Gabriel to restore some of his honor that Maeve, you know, took away. So yeah, it's very sweet when we see Gabriel being honored in the way he should. And Aelin, like, she's like, I was going to let you do this. I just wanted to let your son do it first. So I'm going to give it to you now. And I'm like, oh. (laughs) Poor Gabriel. I just feel so bad for him. (laughs) They're talking about just... It ends up Lorcan is like telling her how much he cares about her and lo- loves her. And she basically proposes to him, like beats him to it. And then she's like, oh, yeah, you could be Lord Lorcan Loken. It's just like the absurdity of that name. And they're just like laughing about it. But Lorcan is like. I'm down. Serious? Yeah. He's like, I would actually do that. I would be called Lord Lorcan Lo- Loken for you. <laughs> Take your last name. And it was, it just got a good chuckle out of me. I just I like what their relationship became. It the started levity. off so mm-hmm. it just started off so like Elite is poor, broken, scheming girl, and then he is just like, oh, I need to go protect me. Blah blah blah. I'm an a hole, and just she broke through that. We needed a little bit of levity after everything. Yeah, right? like we did. Mm-hmm. And another piece of levity that we see is. So Evangeline has won Dor- Darrow over, right? He, she's now his his person, and he loves her and all of this stuff. And we see her wink at Aelin. And the thing that Aelin had asked her to do before Aelin left was to win her her kingdom back. And she handled that with, like, Aelin's seal of approval because she did. She taught Daro how to be a human and how to love again. And in doing so, won it all for everybody. So She sugared him up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then we see the scene that we talked about earlier about the curse being broken and that flowers were growing in the wasteland again. And very sweet moments. And then we also see Rowan as a wedding present or whatever. He's going to build... A theater and a library in Orinth for Aelin. And Aelin's like, we don't have money. We have to rebuild. We don't have, like, we can't do that. And he's like, have you forgotten that now that Maeve isn't the queen of, what is it called? Dornell. The Feylands. Dornell, yeah. Terrace, yeah. Um, now that she is not the queen of Dornell, it goes back to his side of the family. And he gets all of his money back. And so he's like, I'm building you a theater and a library because those are the things that make you happy. And then she gets coronated, the coronation. It was a good coronation scene. Like everyone is there. Everyone is doing so much better, like as much as possible. Like you still have Dorian and Manon who are struggling to come to terms with everything that they've lost, you know, with their parents and 13 and everything and still trying to navigate what their relationship is if they have a relationship like what it's going to look like so there's still very much a lot of grayness there but it was so good I love the coronation and one of the things that was really special to me Tara was the okay kingdom of ash 
has like a epilogue chapter, a better mm-hmm. world, but like the chapter right before it ends with the sentence, tell me tomorrow, which was how Throne of Glass ended between Selena and Kale when he's like, so do you want to know what your first mission is? She's like, oh, tell me tomorrow. And so that was just like Sarah J. Mass coming full circle, like bringing it back to like how it began. So touching. Well, and everybody was wondering why the little folk were helping Aelin. Mm-hmm. And then they come with her crown, her second crown, because Daro, being the sweet person that he is now, her first crown, which is the crown of Terrison, he had to make because Otterlin like destroyed everything, right? And so he made her a crown and he put the flower that he had kept from her uncle's reign, right? And this is a flower that's supposed to bloom when peace is in Terrison, right? And so it's the last one. It's the one that bloomed during her uncle's reign. And Dara was very, very close with her uncle, right? He's the one who did his coronation. And I feel like they were together too. Am I making that up or like, like were they in a relationship? I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I, I thought I read into I, their relationship that they were yeah. like together. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and that's why he didn't have any heirs of his own because he was, both of them didn't have heirs because they were in a relationship together. But I could be making that up or like wishful thinking or something. But anyway, so he put that into her crown. So he gave up the last piece of his memory of his either friend or boyfriend or partner or whatever he was to him and gave it to her. And then the little folk come with Mala's crown and put it on her too. And they just like fit together. I loved it. Mm-hmm. And then she officially, didn't she officially do Lysandra's like swearing in and Adian's blood oath? Mm-hmm. She finally Dream. did it. Like Avian finally got his blood oath that he'd been dreaming and about this, his whole life. <laughs> and then I think she also did a blood oath with Rin too, right? Mm-hmm. So everybody got blood oath. And then we get the better world, which is where Rowan is telling her that he's going to build her, her library and that, you know, it really is going to be a better world. There's going to be kind of like a democracy where people vote for things and you know, you see Nezrin and Sartak leave and Dorian makes an offhanded comment about, I guess I lost another captain of the guard and she's <laughs> feeling bad. And he's like, no, I'd rather have another queen. And Sartak's like, Empress? Yes. And so you see like the queens mainly and the kings kind of going their own way, but all of them still being connected because mm-hmm. even Rolf is a king kind of in his own right. He's the leader of the Mycenaeans. And so like all these people that were nothing are now like kings and queens and they're all friends because they've all been tied together so wonderfully as nothings that when they rose to power, they were still connected. I mean, Dorian was something, I guess, all the time, but like Kale wasn't, but now he's like the right hand. Such an optimistic end to the series. I can't remember if we ever saw Holland again, like in Dorian's mom, like what happened there. And then I want to say, I feel like Knox kind of disappeared as well. Mm -hmm. Like he made an appearance and was like doing all of these key message passing and stuff like that, getting like summoning the army to where they were, but he kind of disappeared. You know, I didn't notice that, but he did. Mm-hmm. And then we do get a little bit of a glimpse of Kale's mom again because she writes yes, in the letter. And she's I like, was I happy I can for come him. visit you with your like children and stuff. And his brother wants to come visit him. And his dad's just left on his own because that's what should happen to the Yeah, bastard. he can be alone in his bitterness. Yeah. Yeah. So it was good. It was a good ending. I would have liked to see Knox again now that you point that out. It stumped and me. And you're looking for at me like I'm going to see him again. No, um, I, but like, I was just the curious. End. Yeah. I was curious if you would have an opinion on it because it was just very abrupt, like to have him in the beginning and then coming back for a couple books and then him being dispatched to come, you know, get help or their army to find their location and all or of whatever. The help and just, uh-huh. But like, we don't hear from him he's always been a really interesting character to me though because he's always had this mystery about him anyway like 
you know, even his eyes, I feel like how they're described are very weird. And as we know in this series, like eyes mean something. <laughs> and, but yeah, I don't know. I was just curious what you thought of it. But yeah, it was like the Knox stuff, Dorian's mom and brother. And those were the only things that like really bothered me. And then everyone got a happy as could be, you know, ever after type of thing, because there's still a lot of things, especially between Dorian and Manon that were. Well, and Lysandra and Adian. Yeah. Like they have some, they have some issues to work out too. Mm -hmm. But, but there was a scene where he was called Prince of Terrison. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember how that came about because Darrow basically told him you will be Prince of Terrison. And I'm wondering if that is, or Lord of Terrison or whatever. And be, I'm thinking that that's because of Lysandra is now a lady of Terrison. Mm-hmm. And then them getting together. Mm-hmm. So it was it was hinted very heavily that they were fully back together. But we didn't get to see a wedding. Is Lysandra going to be in Ash River? Well, unless they do like Lorcan and Lee because she's the lady of the house. Like... It could be Adian, Ash River, whatever the other hell his name was. And then whatever, what's Lysandra's last name? Like, uh, I don't know. What, what is Falcon's last name? Inon or something like that? So she's Lysandra Inon? Inon? Maybe, yeah. Uh, whatever that one was. Enron? Did you say Enron? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> it's something like that. It's um, the 90s, y'all. <laughs> yep. Also, like I just wrote down Lord Lorkin Lockin because that was hilarious and like I loved it. Mr. Ali Lokin. <laughs> but I hope you guys enjoyed the series or re enjoyed the series uh, for those who read it. Yeah, there were a lot. I feel like there us. were a lot of rereads. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, I enjoyed it. There was great character building. You really got invested in these characters. And my one problem is you killed off Gavriel before he could like get his ending, which I know was done for a reason of some sort. I just don't agree with that reason. So I would have liked them to get their happy ending together. I just can't believe it's over. Like we've spent months reading this series, talking about the series and My favorite part of the book has to be like the fellowship between all of the characters because none of them had perfect family upbringings or anything. Like none of them had extremely, I would say, happy childhoods. And for them to just befriend each other and slowly warm up and build trust and then sacrifice for each other, it's that found family that always gets me about the Throne of Glass series. And it is a theme that you'll see in Sarah J. Mass's books, so... I'm just happy, Tara, that you read this with me. Another one of those characters that gets mentioned, but not like anything else, is Vaughn. Because they mention that they have one more cadre member that they have to go find. Yeah, I can't, like the details are so fuzzy to me. I would have to go back and like see. And I I don't even know that we really met Vaughn. He was just mentioned a couple of times. Is he the bird one that turns into like an osprey or something? I don't know. Um, but he he is the one that apparently all the ladies go for because they made a comment about like the ladies will love it if he's here. You know what? How you said that, it makes me think of like Magic Mike or some shit. Just like this gang of like the cadre is just this group of guys that just they're all like sculpted and tall and just mm-hmm. so. I mean, <laughs> I can get behind that except Rowan. for the one dude that's like the the like. What's his name in that movie? Like the caveman one? Oh, no. Like, I can't get behind that dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> but like, Fenris would be like, um, what's his name? My- Matthew Bomber or whatever his name is. That's the like Ken and Barbie dude in it that sings. I'm like, what? Who the hell the, are you talking about? Like proposes. He's like, it's in the movie. Okay. I'm not like. He's the like really. He was on White Collar too. Really attractive. I'll and have to like look a it up. Yuppie, <laughs> yeah, yuppie kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, now I'm trying to like put characters to characters here. Terrence we should probably end this before I like go crazy on 
putting characters to characters. I would be remiss if I didn't like thank all the other people who read the book with us, whether it was second, third time, more, first time. Thank you so much for doing the Throne of Glass read along with us. And, you know, Michael, Vanessa, you both were steadfast supporting the show and watching along and listening and reading with us and the comments. I lived for your comments every single week. And I know Tara did too. <laughs> I loved them. And I'm going to point out that I cleaned up behind me right before we started filming. And I noticed that I have another shoe behind me halfway through filming that I missed because I guess I didn't think that you would be able to see it. Um, So that's for you, Michael. It was not intentional, (laughs) but there's you another little like shoe. And that's actually mine instead of my kids. So It's, it's a family trait, apparently. Mm hmm. But thank you so much for watching and listening. And we hope you enjoyed the chatter behind the Throne of Glass series. And I'm expecting probably, I don't know, in the next couple weeks or so, Tara and I will be back for a fun little like announcement episode ish, something light um, to talk about. So stay tuned for that. We'll be sure to. I am going to convince Sandra to play Fuck, Mary Kill. Like This is a goal of mine, just like her making me read this book series was a goal of hers. It is going to happen at some point, guys. Yes, we're going to figure out what this looks like. <laughs> we're keeping this PG, damn it. For um, Well, actually, we're already past that. We that, I was that about to say, I just said Fuck, Mary Kill. That's not PG, so... <laughs> Like, in the last 30 seconds, we have not been PG. Even every episode, I'm just like, you know what? Scratch that. Never mind. It's, yeah. I mean, the books aren't PG. No. Just wait. Yeah, just wait. Um, Anyway, we have been going on too much now. So, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast or rated us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Please, you know, if you enjoyed, go ahead and do that. And thank you so much for listening and tune in in a couple weeks. Bye.